uh, that started in 1923 with the establishment of the Turkish Republic. Um, you, just a bit, bit of the background information, those of you who don't know this, uh, the, the Republic of Turkey was established in 1923 following a three-year war of independence uh, against some occupying powers who were mainly European and it was actually established to replace the Ottoman Empire which had existed uh, in Turkey starting from the 13th century. So it's sort of um, set out to replace a, a very well established, a deeply rooted um, state system. Of course, it inherited many of its administrative mechanisms, many of its cultural um, and uh, political concepts from the Ottoman period, but uh, it also tried to create a break from the Ottoman Empire and tried to create a unique blend of uh, Turkish culture. And uh, there was a time, especially in the early Republican period, during the first 20 uh, or 25 years of the Republic, to create what has been termed as a Turkish Renaissance. And there were intellectuals who argued that because Turkey had never gone through the Enlightenment that Europe had gone through, it has not had a chance to go through its cultural renaissance and that uh, the um, cultural attempts of the early uh, Republican period mainly aimed at creating a unique Turkish culture which they termed as a Turkish renaissance. And I will talk about this in this uh, cultural effort, a humanism, a unique type of Turkish humanism played a very important role. And this all links back to translation. Um, so the Translation Bureau is the name of the institution I will talk about. Of course, the Turkish is Tercüme Bürosu, for those of you who know. Uh, Tercüme is the old Turkish or Ottoman word for translation and interpreting. Actually, it's mainly used to refer to interpreting, but in modern Turkish, it has also been uh, started to uh, be used for translation. So uh, the literal translation of this institution is the Translation Bureau. Uh, some of the basic concepts that I will be talking about throughout this talk are there. I will just refer to these briefly now. Uh, the, uh, well, the work that I will be presenting today largely derives from my PhD work, which I did in the 1990s. And since then, of course, I have expanded, I have added things as new research has come about. Uh, but uh, the main focus of my PhD research was the period between 1923 and 1960. Now there was a special reason for that. One of them was a political uh, reason because 1923 was the year the Republic was established. So a big political transformation that was experienced. And the year 1960 was the year a military coup took place in Turkey to topple uh, more or less uh, a conservative government that had cultural conservatism but economic liberalism. So it was uh, quite an interesting type of government we had throughout the 1950s. And uh, so this is the political reason. So these two are important political milestones for Turkey. Uh, and um, I should say above that, they are also important turning points for Turkish literature and translation history. Because with 1923, we see a definitive break from an Ottoman repertoire in literature. When we say a, a break, of course, it's not something that happened overnight. It's not something that happened in 1923. It had been uh, taking place since uh, the early 19th century, but the, the year 1923, um, meant that an important transformation took place in the political system, which also had repercussions for education, for literature, uh, for intellectual thought, etc. And the year 1960 is also a breaking point because uh, with the 60s we see a change in Turkey's intellectual climate, uh, an openness to outside intellectual influences, especially from critical thought, Marxism, and leftist thought. And this was something which was happening all around the world in the 1960s. And in the 1960s, we, t we see Turkey sort of coming to a sync with the rest of the world and the rest of Europe in terms of uh, starting to discuss critical concepts about society. 
So I have chosen to focus on the period between these two dates uh, because that really spells the uh, founding of a new Turkish literature, mainly through translation. Uh, and again, uh, the Translation Bureau has really been instrumental in that. Uh, well, one notion that I will talk about is nation building. And I obviously, I don't have the time to go into the political uh, field within which this nation building efforts took place. But as I said, uh, the Republic of Turkey replaced uh, the Ottoman Empire, which um, was a multi-ethnic, multilinguistic empire. And the way it uh, created some form of a unity among its uh, very, very diverse peoples was the notion of uh, religion. So uh, the basic tenet of the Ottoman Empire was Islam and the Islamic idea of the community, which is called the Ummah. And that was the unifying principle of the many nations. And in the Ottoman Empire, you did not have a distinction between a Turk and a non-Turk, but you did have a distinction between a Muslim and a non-Muslim. And non-Muslims were deprived from certain privileges that the Muslim population enjoyed. Uh, so the new republic uh, aimed to transform this unifying principle of religion into the notion of a common language and common history. So they got rid of, they didn't get rid of the notion of religion, but they uh, sort of reduced the emphasis on religion as the glue of the nation and they replaced it with the notion of uh, a common language and a common history. Uh, and that was the foundation of the nation building efforts in the early Republican period that continued well into the 1940s. And then we start seeing some changes there. Another concept that I will refer to is the concept of statism, which is actually an economic concept. It just means that the state owns many of the concerns in the nation, like they own the factories, they own uh, the means of production, but not only that, they also own and uh, operate cultural institutions in the country. So in the case of Turkey, we did not only have a national bank and uh, national factories, but we also had a state opera, as you have in many other countries, a state library, a state conservatory, a state radio, etc., etc. So in the early Republican period, there was a lot of focus on the states, because at that time they were trying to establish the foundations of a young nation, and the economic uh, background would very much be supplied by the state and there was very little room for private initiative, especially throughout the 1920s and early 1930s. Uh, humanism, as I said, is an important concept until the mid-1940s uh, because whenever we talk about uh, Republican reforms, so things that happened from a cultural perspective in the early Republican period, uh, you don't have an ideology to talk about these reforms. Like you don't have Marxism, you don't have liberalism as a pronounced ideology. Statism was not much of an ideology, but more of an economic and political fact. Uh, so some people have argued that humanism, the notion of humanism, was actually the uh, ideological background of the Republican reforms. Now, the main reason for that was because the intellectuals, the statesmen, were arguing that we need um, a principle, a cultural background in Turkey, which will enable us to have a better view of ourselves, a better sense of ourselves. And they said that if we study the classics, Greek classics, European classics, mainly the humanist works, we will understand those common points that make people people. So the universal features of humanity that uh, very much go back to humanism. And actually, uh, many scholars have also resembled it to uh, German neo-humanism, which has a lot of elements of nationalism in it, uh, but I'm not going to go into it. But it's true that Turkish humanism did also have many nationalist components. And of course, we're talking about the 1930s, and uh, it's difficult to spot a European nation who did not have emphasis on uh, nationalism. Um, another concept, a theoretical concept, I will talk about is the notion of planning. And I have borrowed this from the notion of culture planning as introduced by the Israeli culture scholar Itamar Evan Zohar, with whom I'm sure the translation people are very familiar. 
so in his more recent works throughout the 1990s, he talked about the notion of culture planning as an effort to offer new options for a cultural repertoire. So this can be something to talk about when you discuss literature, translation, politics, etc. So whenever you are trying to offer new options, create or import new options for a culture, for a society, it can be in any field whatsoever, we can talk about planning. Now the notion of planning is often confused with the notion of central planning, as was the case, uh, case with communist or socialist governments. So here I'm not using it in the sense of uh, culture, well, central cultural planning, although we do have a bit of that that I will talk about today. But what I'll talk about tomorrow has to do with a much more decentralized notion of cultural planning. So I will argue that although the state, the government, had quite intensive planning efforts in the field of culture, uh, it doesn't mean that there were no other agents outside of the government who partook in uh, those culture planning efforts. So the culture planning was actually a much more disseminated concept and activity that was just not limited to uh, the state and the government. Mm. So uh, the planning, the culture planning period that I will talk about here mainly covers uh, the political single party era in Turkey between 1923 and 1946. And 1946 is the year Turkey ended the uh, single party political system and acceded to a multi-party political system because it was uh, trying to ally itself closely with uh, the United Nations and later on with NATO and the Council of Europe. So it had to get rid of the single party system and it had uh, multi-party elections in 1946. Now the single party, which was the Republican People's Party, uh, won the elections in 1946, so in practice the single government regime continued until the 1950s or the 1950 elections, but uh, theoretically it ended in 1946 and we do uh, see the influence of this in some of the practices of uh, the Republican People's Party in its last period. And then I will talk about something uh, that I have devised, the notion of deep planning. So as much as you can plan culture, and this is something that governments do, certain activist groups do, even individuals can try to plan culture in certain ways, you can also have reversal uh, periods in the cultural planning efforts. And in Turkey, we do see something that we can call as deep planning, that is a reversal in some of the cultural reforms of the previous government. And this is the period between 1946 and 1960. And I will talk how this deep planning reflected on um, translation. Now the deep planning mainly reflected on a notion of nationalism. As I said uh, previously, the notion of nationalism uh, with the Republican period was based on a common language and a common history. And they created special institutions, uh, the linguistic society and the his historical society in the 1930s to further this idea of common language and common history, but there was no uh, sign of religion in that composition. But in the 1950s, you see religion being re-entered or reintroduced into uh, the uh, repertoire of uh, Turkey again. And you see religion becoming a more visible item, uh, a more visible option in this repertoire. Now, how do we see this? We see this because in the 1930s there was a big effort to uh, Turkify Islam, as people called it. Uh, this was supported by uh, the uh, president, then Atatürk, the founder of the republic, and they Turkified the call to prayer, the azan, you know, when people are called to pray in the mosque. That call is usually in Arabic, and that was so in Turkey until 1932. But in 1932, they uh, introduced mandatory call to prayer in Turkish which was uh, cancelled as the first act of the new government in 1950. So you can see how much emphasis they had on religion and how they sort of diverged from the policies of the previous republic. Uh, and they also undid many of the cultural institutions or uh, they dissolved many of the cultural institutions of the 1940s. Now I'll talk about that. Um, another notion that I think is important is the notion of agents, 
an agency. This is, of course, something that comes from trans translation sociology. Now, when I talk about agency, I mean agency both in the uh, sense of cultural agents, so leading people in the society, such as authors, intellectuals, politicians, who were very visible and visibly did things to plan the culture. But I'm uh, also talking about agents who were less visible. Um, so um, I should say second-rate writers, uh, translators who operated in the field of popular literature, um, distributors or even readers. So my notion of agency is anyone that has, that may potentially contribute to uh, the repertoire in the country from a cultural perspective. Uh, cultural institutions are those Republican public institutions that were set up throughout the 1930s and 40s and which uh, were largely cancelled or uh, dissolved by the government in the 1950s. So that is a part of their deep planning efforts. And I'll talk about three of those institutions in connection with uh, translation. And another notion that I think is important to remember is the notion of canon formation. So the notion of the making of a literary canon uh, is, has been taken up by, uh, for example, um, Gregory Justanus, a Greek scholar, discussing uh, how uh, the Greek literary canon, the modern Greek literary canon, was created in the 19th century. Uh, we can see many examples of how literary canons are made. We see that for 19th century Hebrew culture, we see that uh, much later for um, newly created um, states, newly independent states, all uh, governments or all nations that become independent seek to establish themselves a literary tradition. Some have it already because they have existed as, as independent societies within larger entities, but some have to create a literary canon for themselves. And some may have the necessary resources in their folk culture, uh, which then they take and create as a modern literature. They uh, start writing stories and novels based on their traditional sagas, etc. That happens with some countries. But some countries, such as Turkey, which take a drastic or radical break from its old literary tradition, uh, have to create a literary canon from scratch. And that was how it happened in Turkey. And translation was very much instrumental in uh, how this happened. Okay, uh, I will now show you two quotes, you can read those. Um, this, uh, the, the two quotes are by the same person, Ahmed Hamdi Tanpunar. Some of you may have heard his name. He is uh, one of the greatest authors of modern Turkish literature. Uh, his uh, classic, A Peace of Mind, has recently been uh, translated into English in a very, very good translation by uh, a translator called Erdal Gürkner from Duke University. Uh, but he was one of those people who were um, a very sort of liminal or in-between character. He was stuck between a more uh, religiously oriented, traditional Ottoman legacy and the modern Turkish legacy, or what was uh, intended to be a modern Turkish legacy. So in his writings, you always see a sense of nostalgia for the old, but also a yearning for something new, something which will happen, etc. Uh, so this example is uh, not unique to him. This discourse was very much upheld by intellectuals in Turkey, starting from the 19th century. So uh, literary people saw translation as an important tool in the making of a new Turkish literature. Many of them considered the Ottoman literature inferior because they argued that Ottoman poetry was old-fashioned and nearly obsolete because Ottoman court poetry was a very highly elevated form of discourse that had elements of Arabic, Persian, and Ottoman Turkish, and it was extremely formulaic. The metaphors, for example, had to be used. You couldn't create or invent a new metaphor. That is why a lot of people like Gibbs, the famous Ottomanist, called uh, Turkish people a singularly uninventive people. But others now, modern scholars, are now starting to see the creativity within those limits of the metaphors and how creative Ottoman poets were given their uh, poetic limitations. 
so they said that by translating from the West, we can actually learn about new traditions, new genres, and start creating ourselves a new form of literature, which could better represent a new nation, a new republic in the making. So uh, this, was, this was not published in 1998. It's just the edition that I borrow here. This was published in the 1930s. So this author says a great number of works have indeed been translated into our language because uh, starting from the, uh, from the 1840s, uh, Western novels, mainly from French, started entering uh, Ottoman Turkish. People started translating those. Yet these translations, which were selected randomly and carried out without being subject to a specific program, did not meet the need, and what is more, they did not even create the need for translation. So it's interesting. Here it's not enough to translate those. It's also your task as a translator to create a need for translation, to create awareness in the people about the importance of translation. Uh, our language has no knowledge of a vast literary past. A few novels, five or ten philosophy books, and a few elementary informative works. These are the gains made by our language in a time period approaching a century. Okay. And this is also a period where Turkey changed alphabets. The alphabet reform took place. When was that? 1928. I'll oh, talk a little bit about that, yeah. So it, it brought a huge break. Mm -hmm. Uh, with the Ottoman past. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's, that's Extremely lamentable, very, very regrettable. If you ask anyone today, that's what they mm -hmm. would say. And we don't know whether this was necessary, but mm -hmm. that's how things happened. And this meant that uh, nearly no or very few Ottoman books were actually transcribed into the new alphabet, which shows you that they could have transcribed everything and sort of carried on the old corpus of works into the new alphabet, but they did not. Really? Which means that uh, the, the alphabet reform also had the um, aim of creating a break in the literary repertoire and it triggered the formation of a new repertoire. The whole culture of the culture. So strange, isn't it? It is very strange, very strange, very traumatic. It means that people now cannot read the documents in their family from a hundred years ago. Oh, that's yeah. But now it's uh, Ottoman. I mean, Ottoman is not that difficult to learn. Mm -hmm. But it's also very interesting that this idea that Ottoman was so hard to learn mm -hmm. and children had to take at least three years to learn the alphabet. That's not true. Mm -hmm. I went to a course in Ottoman and I learned mm -hmm. to read basic printed material in six months. And you can do that. Six months? Six months for basic wow. printed material. <coughs> is it on Google Translate? <laughs> No. 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 So you are recovering there. You are recovering. So no, no, no. It's not that easy to recover. Because to be able to read documents, especially from the 18th and 17th centuries, which was really the height of more elevated Ottoman period, and to be able to read the different styles that they used, and they uh, had them handwritten, these were manuscripts, you really need much more. You need to know more about Arabic and Persian. You Persian, also need yeah. to, you need mm -hmm. to study, that's true. But to learn the basic letters, you, you know, it's nothing to be scared of. It's just an alphabet like any other. Of course, you need some background. You have to know how to check things in the dictionary, which is a task in itself. Yes. But it's not that scary. I mean, you can do it. Many people have now started doing it. Of course, if you're a historian, if you're a Turkish literature scholar, you have to learn it, and people do it. So when you when you when you mentioned that uh, you it took it took you six months to learn some Ottoman, do you what do you mean by that? Do you mean uh, reading skills, reading skills? I did not talk. intend to write, so I didn't no. concentrate on writing. Talking that's a misnomer because mm -hmm. Ottoman Turkish uh, you. You can talk Ottoman, you can use Ottoman words, mm -hmm. but uh, the, some of the concoctions, or uh, I should say some of um, uh, certain syntactic features in Turkish too, uh, need to be learned when you are learning Ottoman. But no one will speak Ottoman as such. It's not a spoken language nowadays. But to learn to read it and to understand, understand it. it. Understand. Yeah. And then it has its periods, and if you're reading a simple popular book, it's not different from another book written ten years after ten years. in the new alphabet. So there are all kinds of different documents. Mm -hmm. Depends. You have to study, of course. Also, oh. the spoken language changed also. This is what you mean? The so spoken language did not change that drastically. But of course, lexical items did change as neologisms were being introduced. Mm -hmm. 
But uh, I would say spoken language did not change to the extent uh, the written language did. Because the former uh, written language did not really reflect the oral language. Mm -hmm. It was much more elevated. Wow, how interesting. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, so the same gentleman, the writer, says, yet the question of translation is not only a question of good intentions, it's a question of money and program. If we wish to create Turkish learning, we need to start it within a state program and by mobilizing all of the facilities of our country. And this guy was not alone in this call. A lot of intellectuals, we see that in the discourse of these people, always called for state involvement. They said, without state support, we cannot have a good program in translation. And if we want to translate the classics of the world into our language, we need money, we need systems. So there were these constant calls that in a way created the need for translation before translation came about. So that was what happened throughout the 1930s. Okay, now actually the government was not foreign to the idea of planned translation movements. It started to have uh, translation institutions already in the 19th century. They started training translators, certain scientific works were translated, but literature was never translated to the extent that people wanted it to. So already in 1921, when the first assembly was established, um, Grand National Assembly was established, they launched a special committee, a committee on original and translated works. And between 1921 and 1926, this committee produced 30 translations on sociology, education, etc. And you will see that uh, they produced 68 works altogether, so nearly half of them were translations. So that shows you how much translation was needed, especially in the field of so sociology, education, etc. Uh, and this committee was closed down in 1926. And of course, they printed materials in Ottoman script because the um, language reform had not started yet. And then in 1927, they launched another uh, more programmed effort in translation, uh, a, a, a series of books that is geared more towards secondary school students called Samples from World Literature. And in the course of a year or so, they wrote out 10 uh, translations of classics, which were like summaries, abridged classics for, to give people an idea in secondary schools. And then in 1928, we had the alphabet reform, and uh, this committee, uh, the, the, the effort of samples from world literature also stopped. And actually in 1928, between 1928 and nearly 1932, we see this big gap and a standstill in the publishing activities. Many, many private publishers closed down because they ended up with huge stocks that they didn't know what to do Did with. Did you think they about didn't. the U.S. economy at the time? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. There was general... Of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All yeah. the world was like that. Of course, of course. Not just that. Who was Plus, sponsored? In our case, yeah. Who was not sponsored by them? Including our military coup here was sponsored by them. By them. I'm not sure if they also sponsored no. the military coup in Turkey. No. Well... Which in 1960, yes, that could have been the case. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, they, yeah. they are usually behind any coup that happens yes. anywhere, I think. Uh, but at this time, no, Turkey did have developing ties with the U.S. economic ties, but it also had some ties with Russia. Ah, oh, Russia. So it it was more in the middle. Mm -hmm. It was not fully allied with the U.S. Mm -hmm. in that time. Uh, so in 1928, as I said, there was this traumatic break uh, in publishing, and. Uh, on the other hand, you also had a huge campaign to increase literacy in the country. Because literacy, in 1928, we don't have reliable statistics, but it is supposed to be around 10% at the time. At the time. So only 10% of the population could read and write, because education was very limited, especially it was uh, very limited for women. For women had very little access to formal education. Uh, so only 10%. Maybe maximum 15% of the population uh, read and wrote at that time. And they started a huge literary camp literacy campaign. They set up uh, adult literacy courses, uh, which they interestingly called the nation's schools, uh, which uh, taught adults to read and write in the new alphabet. And that managed to increase literacy up to 40%, uh, or 45%, I think, at the end of the 40s. But uh, the real hold, well, I would say um, the, 
starting with the 1960s, we start seeing an increase again, and now the rate of literacy is much higher. It's much higher. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How much would you say? Over 95%. 90. Oh, yeah. Over 95%. No, 95. Yeah. 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 Pretty good. Yeah. yeah. Well, it doesn't mean too much. <laughs> <laughs> Reading and writing is one thing, and what you read and write is another thing, mm -hmm. of course. Definitely. Okay, uh, so because intellectuals were always asking for more translations, uh, the government decided to take this matter in its hand and it organized a publishing congress, the first publishing congress. Since then, there have been five others, actually four others, who had the fifth one in uh, 2010, I believe. Um, so uh, you see the people down there. On the far left, you have the uh, president of the time, Ismet Inönü. At that time, Atatürk was dead. He died in 1938, and Ismet Inönü replaced him. In the middle, you have Refik Saydam, who was the prime minister. He was a doctor, a medical doctor by training. And to his right, you have uh, the minister of culture that I'll talk about briefly, Hasan Ali Yücel. He was an intellectual himself. He worked as a journalist. He worked as a teacher. Uh, he wrote. So he was he came from that group of intellectuals who wanted more translations, more state activity. Uh, so he actually um, initiated this publishing congress. Uh, so they said the aim is to introduce order, so to plan publishing in a way, and enable private publishers to find themselves a place in this larger area of planned publishing activities. There were seven committees established in that congress. And one of them was dedicated to translation. So there was a committee on translation which had about 20 members and they uh, held meetings and discussed what to do about translation, how to speed up translations, how to improve the quality of translations. They spoke about a number of issues and they decided uh, to launch a special official translation bureau, Tarjume Birusu, uh, and they also said that it should bring out a journal, Tarjume, which means translation again, uh, to uh, improve the quality of discourse and discussions about translation. Uh, and they also adopted a list of works to be prioritized for translation. And that list really had hundreds of works. Not all of them have been translated, but uh, they introduced the list. And later on, in, with intervals of several years, they introduced other lists too. So, you know, this kind of activity was very common. Uh, they wanted to show what is best for the people, for publishers, then, and they offered something, a limited choice within which publishers can contribute to a, a literary canon in Turkey. This was the Minister of Culture and, and Education, well, I'm sorry, he's the Minister of Education, that was how it was called then, uh, but he pretty much worked as both the Minister of Education and Culture. He also founded a number of cultural institutions. Uh, the Village Institute is an educational institution I'll talk about. So he served as Minister of Education between 1938 and 1946, but with the transition to the multi-party government and with the backing in some cultural policies, he dropped out of favor and uh, he uh, had to resign. In, he was forced to resign in 1946 and he remained an MP until 1950, after which he worked as an independent writer and publisher. Um, okay, so what was this translation bureau like? The translation bureau was set up in 1939 and started operating in 1940. It, held, it had its first products in 1940. And I'm not sure if you can see it from the back there, but here you have the number of books they brought out each year. Mm. Okay, Until 1946, they brought out all of the books collectively on Republic Day, which is very symbolic in itself. All the books that they brought out would be brought out all together on the 29th of October, the Republic Day. So that already shows you the political and ideological mm -hmm. aspect of this bureau. But after 1946, again, interestingly, of the political inclinations of the future uh, governments, they stopped doing this and they said it was best to have them published as you went along. So they started to be published throughout. Uh, so you see, in 1940, they started with 10 works, and then 41, 13, 42, 27, 43, 67, 44, 97, 45, 115, and 46, 152. 
And that was the peak of the activities of the transition era. And you see the percentages there. Uh, 1946 was the year where they brought out a total of 12% of all of their production. And you see after 46, just look at the percentile figures, you see that the uh, value of the books published in that specific year started dropping percentage-wise in the whole uh, efforts of the Transition Bureau. The Transition Bureau continued operating until 1966. And after the military coup of 1960, there was some new activity, new energy in its uh, workings, but somehow uh, the government did not prioritize it. And at that time, private publishers had also become quite um, successful and uh, quite influential, so maybe there was not much uh, need felt for it anymore. Uh, but it uh, produced, after all, over 1,100 uh, 1, uh, translations, including reprints. I'm sorry, is it 1,100? One one th nearly 1,100, yeah, oh. over 1,000. Yeah, maybe. just, okay, over. Yeah. So it was a huge effort yeah, that yeah. Uh, spanned mm -hmm. over 26 years. Mm -hmm. Very nice. But uh, the majority of the work was done, I should say, the interesting work was done between 1940 and 1946. No. 46. So the focus of the Bureau was the notion of humanism until 1946 until the end of the single party era. Um, because they uh, believe that humanism should be the source of uh, this new intellectual understanding in Turkish, and therefore they prioritize the translation of humanist works, or I should say classics, classics uh, yeah. from mm -hmm. Greek and Latin. I'll show you the figures. Yeah, there they are. And uh, until 1946, they always linked translation with the notion of modernization, westernization, how translation can be instrumental in creating a new national culture, etc. Mm -hmm. um, so in a way, until 1946, we can say translation was both the subject and object of planning, which means translation was a planned activity in itself. They tried to plan translation activity under the Translation Bureau, but not only the Translation Bureau. But they also used translation as a means of cultural planning. They offered options through translation. So translation both planned and was being planned at the same time. This is 19, until 1946. But then uh, this phase of deep planning came about that I was talking about. And the shift of focus happened in 1946. Uh, but you see it felt even more after 1949. But the shift was that translations role was reduced to literature only, or literary modernization only. They no longer talked about a Turkish renaissance, they talked about a literary renaissance. So they reduced the political uh, sphere within which translation was at. So you see, uh, Greek classics, that is the heart of humanist works, and Latin classics, there were 94 translations published altogether, only five of them were published after 1949. So you see, the bulk was published in the 1940s. Again, Latin classics. But are they, uh, are they keeping the, uh, reprinting them? And so yeah, I'll talk about oh. it. Yeah, some are being reprinted, yes. Yeah. Uh, Latin classics, uh, there were 31 translations altogether. There were 27 of them published in, until 1948, and four of them between 1949 and 1951. And Russian classics, that's very interesting. Mm -hmm. Russian classics did have an important role in the workings of the Translation Bureau. They actually had more works from Russian, I believe, than English in the first phase. Mm -hmm. So there were 68 books between 1943 and 1950, only six between 1950 and 60, but then back 14 mm -hmm. between 1960 and 1966. Now, these, during the uh, operation of the Translation Bureau, some of these works were reprinted. But the quality was very bad, and they were only sold in uh, the bookstores of the Ministry of Education after, after the 1950s. You mean the translations were banned, or the paper? Or the no, 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 the, the paper, the, 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 yeah, the binding, it was poor quality, it wasn't attractive. These books did not look attractive to begin with. They had very plain white and black covers, and you know they didn't appeal to you as a reader as such. But the content was what made them interesting. But after 1950, there wasn't too much effort to distribute them. 
because in the past they were, well, throughout the 40s, they were distributed um, through the network of the government in schools, in people's houses. I will say a little bit about this. And then in the 1950s, that was no longer the case. So you could buy them if you were interested, but you were not offered them, especially. Okay. Uh, so what were the source literatures? Uh, French is number one source literature, which is not surprising. I hear it was the same in Brazil. Uh, French uh, language and literature was very dominant in Turkey until the mid uh, 1990s, uh, until the mid 20th century. Uh, German, uh, oops, I'm sorry, there's something. 113? Yeah, yeah, yeah no, 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 German is wrong, and French is 138. Ah, German yes. is 100. Sorry, so mm -hmm. I missed one there. Mm -hmm. Ancient Greek, 94 translations mm -hmm. altogether, I told you. Russian, 88 translations. Uh, English classics, 80 translations. And there was a category called Oriental mm -hmm. Islamic classics. Mm -hmm. However, they also included Chinese and Indian ones. Mm -hmm. So it was a very mixed category. It's not fair to reduce it to Islamic mm -hmm. classics only. No Latin? Uh, Latin I showed you. It didn't make it to the top five list. 31 uh, translations. 31 translations. And I also have a question. Uh, were the, uh, was there a standard, for example, were the books, uh, did the books need to have a special number of pages? Well, not really. Because I'm talking about translating, we are talking about translating different languages. So, for example, if you translate a, sen a sentence in Portuguese into English, it might be longer yeah. there than no if you do guidelines. the opposite. So yeah. that, that's why I am asking. No, there were no such guidelines. No. No. Um, but I would say in, in terms of the fullness of the translation, uh -huh. uh, the integrity, the fullness was a very important concern of the translation. In all of their principles and guidelines, they said fullness of the text needs to be observed. No omissions or additions can be made to the text. But they didn't specify, uh -huh. yeah, they didn't like omissions at all. Omissions, yeah. okay. Because that was a common problem in the Turkish publishing market at the time. Mm -hmm. A lot of translations were abridged, they were omitted, etc. Mm -hmm. But the translation bureau classics are very reliable in that they did not omit much. We know that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, yeah, and these are the main source authors. Plato, 30 works, Moliere, 27 works, Balzac, 22, Shakespeare, 22, and then Dostoevsky, Tolstoy, mm -hmm. Chekhov, and you also have good. So the classic fair, I think anywhere yeah. you go in the world, if you have a series of classics, you will end up with more or less the same names. But the Russians, yeah, so the Russian that marks that. Maybe Dostoevsky, yeah, Tolstoy, but Chekhov. Yeah, wouldn't really be considered in the big now. Canon, I guess not. Okay, these were some of the people who worked for the Bureau. The Bureau had a loose structure. It didn't employ people as such. It did, but they weren't uh, supposed to be there full time. They were just members of the committee and editorial board. And these were some of the people who are also poets, who were also teachers, uh, university professors, intellectuals. You see only one woman in this group, which mm -hmm. was actually representative of the general makeup of the bureau. There would be one or two women, but mostly it would be men. And unfortunately, this is something which has not changed that much. Well, it has, but not, not as much as I would like it. Um, the people you see here, um, at the top next to the lady, you have Nurullah Hattaj, who was the first chairman of the bureau. And sitting right below him is Sabahattin Eyvolu, who was the second chairman of the bureau. And right underneath, the guy in the white suit is Orhan Veli, a very famous Turkish poet who's been translated into many languages. He was also working for the bureau, but he had a very short-lived life, unfortunately. And next to him, you have uh, Jayat Sıkkı another famous Turkish poet who worked for the bureau. Here, this picture just tells you how small the literary and cultural circles were and how closely they worked and collaborated at the time. Okay, so um, I talked a little bit about humanism, but until 1946, Humanism and literary canon formation were the main two functions attributed to literature by the translation bureau. 
uh, again, when we look at uh, the journal Tarjume, you see that in many, many pieces, it was always the same idea. Through humanism, we will be able to learn more about ourselves, and we will also look at our own folk sources with a new eye, because we will learn about universal culture, etc. And starting already in 1939 in the Publishing Congress, the priority list started by saying that it's recommended that among the works included in the list, those relating to humanist culture should be attached significance. And that was like the motto that uh, the Bureau followed until 1946. And uh, the Bureau was very instrumental uh, in defining what was canonical from what was not canonical. Through the lists and through its publications, it showed the people what was classical and what was to be revered, what was to be respected. Okay, So that introduced a break from, I don't want to say popular literature, but maybe modern classics, who were not included in the publications of the transition. And uh, they also created a certain discourse on the importance of classics, the classical writers. Uh, so they also encouraged the establishment of um, a concept of originality and authorship, which did not exist as strongly in the field of uh, mm -hmm. popular literature. So the author, the source, mm -hmm. became much more important than what it used to be before that. Because uh, the Turkish culture inherited a lot of practices from the Ottoman culture, and in the Ottoman culture, anonymity was a very important factor. Okay? Mm -hmm. Authorship was not as strongly pronounced mm -hmm. because people borrowed from each other as a literary mm -hmm. uh, sign of literary creativity. They wrote responses to each other, quoted from each other. So there was a much open area for exchange, literary exchange and creativity. Okay. So as I said, the Transition Bureau was not alone in that it was a part of the cultural network of the government. And it uh, can be most closely linked, there are other institutions to which it can be linked, but it can be most closely linked to three institutions. One of them is uh, people's houses. These were community centers established already in 1932 in follow-up of older Ottoman uh, community centers, I should say. Uh, and uh, they uh, continued operating until 1951, and then they were closed down and the whole buildings were confiscated because the buildings belonged to the uh, ruling party during the single party regime, the Republican People's Party. So the state nationalized uh, their uh, buildings and they closed down because they argued that uh, these had really become centers for furthering the ideology of the single party era. So they were closed down. Uh, now, uh, how were they linked to the translation efforts of the Translation Bureau? First of all, they had libraries, and uh, there were many hundreds and hundreds of people's houses in the cities, and again hundreds uh, in villages called people's rooms. And all of them always had a library, because reading is really a very big uh, issue. It's like a mission. Increasing uh, literacy and reading was a mission for the government. And they held contests, book reading contests. Uh, they would have students participating in contests, uh, bragging about how many books they uh, read. And they also held uh, summary contests, where they would read the classics and summarize. And the best summary would be given the first prize. And they also uh, had drama branches where they uh, staged a lot of plays. And both the libraries, the contests, and the drama branches always used the classics by the Translation Bureau. So the Translation Bureau saw an outlet, a consumption area in the people's houses. And uh, people had their first encounter with the books by the Translation Bureau in the people's houses. Another institution were the village institutes. These were schools opened up in rural areas by the government, starting from 1940. And in the 1950s, they were merged with the teacher training schools, and they lost their experimental sense. The idea with the village institutes was that the students would be trained in practical agricultural matters, um, animal husbandry, handicrafts, uh, in addition to more formal educational subjects. Mm -hmm. And that was an experience that uh, aimed to educate people where they are without bringing them to the cities. And then making sure that they went back to their villages and they uh, worked there as teachers themselves, training, educating the people there. Now the idea was very good, but it was not very popular among the people. 
People did not like them because these schools were taking their children away from them, indoctrinating in God knows what, not teaching them religion. You know, there was always this clash between the people and the government's ideas. And least of all, they uh, liked the fact that girls were also being called uh, to enroll in these schools. And they did not like girls going to school. And they don't today. I yeah, I'm sure. Not, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> so actually, uh, in terms of public, how many would you say percentage-wise would have been reached by the program? This village institute, very few. Actually, they didn't, they couldn't have that many schools because it requires a huge organization effort. In many places, they actually have the students build the school building, and you know everything was created from scratch. Um, many of them were at the level of primary school, and there was one at the level of secondary school, and then a few others. So not too many of them existed. But they were very experimental, very yeah. practical, hands-on, and they gave great importance to reading. They had a mandatory reading hour where those poor village boys and girls would have to sit down and read Sophocles. And you have the memoirs of these people. They were saying, we didn't understand what we read. But our teachers said, you have to go on reading, and in time, understanding will come. And it came. So many of these people did go on to be writers and poets, and you know they uh, turned out to be uh, teachers themselves, professors. So the initial group of people trained in these institutes were quite good, actually. So maybe that was not such a bad idea. Mm -hmm. uh, there were also teachers, especially in the areas around Ankara, the capital, uh, who were members of the Translation Bureau, even the chairman of the Translation Bureau, Sabati Neubol, who was a teacher at the village institutes. And they were teaching foreign languages, they were teaching French. So you have many people who shared the same uh, network, first in the Translation Bureau and then in the village institutes. And of course, they always recommended the reading of those books. They made their students read the books of the Translation Bureau. And we did do slowly see a new generation of writers being trained in the village institutes with a new sensibility, with a new idea of canonicity and literature. And it was through the village institutes that Turkey created its special uh, genre of village novel in the 1950s. And uh, I think uh, it was Marco who wanted to work on translating the first uh, example of a village novel. But uh, there were, an, yeah, uh, Mahmoud Makal called uh, Bizinköy, Our Village. Uh, so Yashar Kemal is also in that genre. He came a little later. Yeah, yeah. yeah, he also came out in the 1950s. Tradition. You have Fakir Baykur. Yeah, you have many others who wrote in this tradition. Uh, it's a, a, a blend of, you know, uh, the, the rural reality mixed with social realism. Uh, and another institution that tra the Translation Bureau was closely linked with was the State Radio. The State Radio was set up in 1927 in Istanbul. And of course, it reflected uh, the practices of the government to a large extent. And when uh, people's houses had big plays being staged, and they, some of the people's houses were very big, and they did uh, operate like professional theaters. Mm -hmm. And they had very good performances. And their performances were broadcast live on radio. And everyone would listen to them, because we didn't have TV, mm -hmm. and only one channel on the radio. Mm -hmm. So that was one way in which the people got in touch with the products of the mm -hmm. Translation Bureau, because many of those plays were translated by the Bureau members. And then uh, in the State Radio in the 1940s, you have what uh, a special show called The Book Hour, mm -hmm. where you would have a very important writer and librarian, Adnan Ötüken, go on for about half an hour, although this is The Book Hour, is half an hour, and introduce new books. And he dedicated one special show to introducing the books by the Translation Bureau. So like, these were some of the ways in which the people encountered, had direct contact with the books of the Translation Bureau. Otherwise, the distribution was not very good. I will talk a little bit about that. Mm. But uh, the schools, the people's houses, the village institutes were places where those books always made their way. This is a picture from one of those village institutes. Köy means village, institutu is institute, so a village institute. You see that it's co-ed, girls and boys mix. Mm -hmm which was not very popular in the heart of Anatolia. And this is uh, from 1932, a library from the Ankara People's House, one of the largest people's houses. Mm -hmm. And you see very few women there mm -hmm. in the background. Yeah. 
You don't. <laughs> yeah. But my father-in-law, who uh, was born in 1926, so when uh, he was in primary and secondary education, these people's houses did exist in his mm -hmm. area. And he remembers that the libraries were open until 10 p.m. Mm -hmm. so that people who come out of work or school could go there and read. And this is not something you would find in later periods. Now, yes, but not earlier, no. Okay, so did the Transition Bureau have a specific transition policy? Yes, it did. It issued guidelines, and through the discourse it created in its journal, it showed us what is important in translation for people at the time. First of all, the lists are very important. The translation policy mainly focused on the selection of titles, the selection of books to be published. And uh, one focus they had, like fullness of the translation, was on directness of the translation. They said, as much as possible, translations have to be made directly from their sources which was not so much the case in Turkey before that time. Even English books like Shakespeare was sometimes being translated through French. Mm -hmm. You had that very uh, as a common occurrence. So mm -hmm. they always uh, called for direct translations, which was rarely the case for Greek and Latin. Those were most of the time still mediated translations. Um, another thing was that they started prioritizing elements of source culture and source author. Like uh, before the Translation Bureau, the practices of the publishing houses varied. There, were, there was no standard way of indicating the writer's name, for example. So with the Translation Bureau, sort of a standard cover design came about, where you would have the name of the, uh, the title of the book, the name of the author, and in the title pages, uh, you would always have the translator's name, which was not very common until that time, and you would have uh, sometimes also the original uh, title of the book. So they started showing us that uh, it's not just the target features which are important, it, the source also matters, and that was a novelty for Turkey at the time. Um, in terms of the linguistic features, many people do ask that because the Translation Bureau was connected to the government, did it perhaps have a more uh, you know, purist linguistic approach or did it use more neologisms, did it use less Ottoman words? No. These translators used what other translators working for other institutions used, and most of them were working for private publishers too. So you know, they were um, working in many kind of ways, and they upheld a similar kind of discourse, mixing the current usages of the day, both Ottoman and Turkish words. Okay. Um, so a final point here is about the strategies observed by the translators. People always want to know whether uh, these translations were more domesticating or foreignizing, because we tend to think that it has to be either or. But when we look at the discourse developed by these translators, editors, especially in the journal, Tarjani, we see that they always advised a fine balance. They said translation is about striking a balance between acceptability, adequacy, or foreignization, domestication. They usually use the terms free translation as opposed to uh, literal or word for word translation. So they said you have to have um, a balance between these two. Of course, saying it is one thing, doing it in practice is another thing. And surprising, surprisingly few scholars have studied the text of these translations. I myself have uh, studied three or four of them in detail. And in, in those examples, you do see quite a balance between... Uh, you have aspects which are kept, uh, foreign names are retained as such in the original spelling. You have sometimes... Um, foreign measurements which are used without being converted. But then on the other hand, you have sentences being divided to be read more fluently in Turkish. So you have elements from both domestication and foreignization being used, but more studies are needed. And maybe, I don't know, corpus linguistics would be a very good tool in studying the strategies of uh, the books by the translation. So, uh, the Transition Bureau sounds like a wonderful model, and this is how many people see it today. It, it was, you know, it did something that private publishers would never be able to do for that time. I can hear people thinking, oh, we should introduce it here. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so. Not anymore. <laughs> right. Uh, however, when we look at the position of the Transition Bureau in the larger uh, market for translated literature, you actually see that it did not occupy that big of a place. 
uh, first of all, you see the number of co copies per edition was 3,000. So not too many, until 1958. And many of them, as I said, were distributed through schools and village institutes and whatnot. And I suspect few copies were released to the free market. And at that time, depending on well, the, the population numbers, I looked at the census figures for this. So in 1945, it turns out there is one copy per over 6,000 people. So you can't really talk about the popularity or the wide dissemination of these books. Although they were available in libraries and schools, which sort of, I'm sure, increased their um, availability. And uh, we're looking now in 1935, 15% uh, of the population were liter literate. In 1949, this was 40%. So these books really addressed less than half of the population, again. Uh, and another problem, just like the students in the village institutes, how much did the rural population or the poorer working class in the urban centers understand these books? How much, what did they get from the Greek classics? What did they get from the very sophisticated ideas which were presented and the language in which these were presented? That is debatable. And affordability is another issue. Some scholars have maintained uh, that these books were actually um, more expensive than the market average. So in a poor country, did people really prioritize buying these books in their already um, limited budget? I don't know. That is another question. So although the effort was there, it may not have created the impact that we think it did. So you, you, you were saying that you have the primary market uh, Side by side. Oh, yes, and I'll talk about that tomorrow. Uh, <laughs> so you have to come back tomorrow. I will. <laughs> yeah, okay. I will show you some figures that shows that the translation bureau actually had a very small place in the general market. In ah. terms of numbers. Now, looking at how uh, the. So what do people, readers, scholars think about the translation bureau today? They praise it in their They say it was such a wonderful effort. More conservative people, more religiously driven people would say, yes, good effort, but the selection of books was very limited. They didn't have enough Islamic books, which was a point that you also have to admit. But uh, most people see it as a symbol of modernization. So, translation bureau is equated with intellectual modernization. And that's a bit of a sad story because many people that the project of modernization has not been completed in Turkey. That it was left in half, unfinished. So the translation bureau always invokes some nostalgic feelings of sadness, you could say, from a somatic perspective. Uh, but we do have many re-editions and reprints. There was a big... Um, campaign by an, uh, a daily Jumburiet uh, in 1998. Uh, they gave out one reprint of a translation bureau classic each Tuesday. And this was a campaign that went on maybe for a couple of years. So they gave out a lot, a lot of those books. But very, very bad editions, very poor copies. <coughs> and since then, these, some of these books have been reprinted by other publishers, private publishers too. Some have just reprinted them without touching them. Some have done linguistic revisions to make them more accessible to the younger generations in terms of vocabulary. And uh, we can say that the translation bureau has also served as a source of inspiration for larger publishers. The more recent one is Ishbankası Kültür Yayınları. Interestingly, they have a series they have named after Hasan Ali Yücel, the former Minister of Education who created the translation bureau. And uh, today they have uh, brought out around 400 works. And some of them are actually reprints of translation bureau works, with very careful reworkings or re-editions in hardcover, very chic, very nice. But they were definitely inspired by the translation bureau. Mm -hmm. So you can say the legacy lives on. It's mm -hmm. still there. Everybody has heard about it. You wouldn't have anyone who hasn't heard about mm -hmm. uh, the translation bureau, at least among university graduates. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this was when the Jumhuri newspaper decided to bring out uh, one book every week. They introduced this with this. Vedat Vignol was a former translator working at the translation bureau. Since then he has died. He died when he was 90-something. Mm -hmm. So he wrote this very nice introduction to this campaign. And they had uh, very big names expressing their views about what they thought about the translation bureau, how much 
they valued them and how much <coughs> they had contributed to culture and so Okay, so what are the views of translation scholars? Like yourself, many translation scholars were misled into thinking that the translation bureau made up the bulk of translation activity in Turkey at this time. Because this is the impression you get, because people talk so much about it, the works are still around, you see them, so you have the impression that they were the main publishing activity in the field of translation. Well, they were not at all. So I'll show you tomorrow that they actually have a very small place. Um, and unfortunately, because of this, people have not looked at the activities of the private publishers. Now, and we have PhD students, MA students who are starting to do that, which is good. So that impression is changing. And uh, the current view is that without translation bureau, the Turkish literature would not be where it is today. And that, I think, yes, they have a point. I think the translation bureau did change a number of conventions in translation, in terms of strategies and policies, and they did uh, bring readers in touch with different genres, different ideas, different themes, and they helped introduce uh, realism into Turkey, for example. And I think that in that sense, they, their contribution has really been large, and I do think that they have been able to plan Turkish literature to a large extent. That's all I can. Mm -hmm. Thank, Thank you very much.